um, from which the book uh, came. Uh, so to welcome you to our panel on Hoosier Philanthropy, the History of Giving in Indiana. Uh, I am Nicole Edgeson. I am the Alexander M. Bracken Professor of History at Ball State University, and I was uh, at that uh, panel, participated in, in the panel that produced the book and uh, have uh, a piece in the book that Greg edited. Um, and but the, our focus tonight is going to be primarily 20th century history. The people we're going to hear from tonight are 20th century historians. And it's certainly the case that Indiana uh, and the Indiana Historical Society uh, and many, I think, uh, members of the panel have benefited from the generosity of Eli Lilly and the Lilly Foundation. But I do want to give a nod to my own domain of the 19th century. Uh, my piece in this volume is on Calvin Fletcher, the Indianapolis businessman and banker who uh, played a important role uh, in early Indiana philanthropy and in founding the Indiana Historical Society. Uh, so with that nod to the 19th century, we'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, Gregory Witkowski, who edited the volume, is a senior lecturer of nonprofit management and affiliate faculty at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University. Before joining the faculty at Columbia, he helped found the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University, and he taught there for seven years. Before that, he was uh, my colleague and Jim Conley's colleague at Ball State University teaching European history. He has authored or edited three books, uh, the Campaign State, German Philanthropy and Transatlantic Perspective, and Hoosier Philanthropy. His current research is on the role of philanthropy and nonprofit organizations in the relief, recovery, and reconstruction of New York City after the 9-11 attacks. Our next speaker, after Greg gives a kind of introductory overview, uh, is Tyrone McKinley Freeman, who is an Associate Professor of Philanthropic Studies and Director of Undergraduate Programs at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Uh, previously, he was a professional fundraiser for social services, community development, and higher education organizations. He was also Associate Director of the Fundraising School, where he trained nonprofit leaders in the United States, Africa, Asia, and Europe. He's a graduate of Lincoln University and has two master's degrees, one in adult education from Indiana University and another in, in urban and regional planning from Ball State University. His PhD is in phil philanthropic studies from Indiana University. He is the co-author of Race, Gender and Leadership in Nonprofit Organizations, which was published in 2011 and is the author of Madam C.J. Walker's Gospel of Giving, Black Women's Philanthropy During Jim Crow, published in 2020, which you can see over his right shoulder in his Zoom window. Ruth K. Hansen is an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin Whitewaters College of Business and Economics and director of the Institute for Nonprofit Management Studies. She teaches classes in nonprofit organizations, fundraising, organizational behavior, and research methods. Her research focuses on the theory and practice of fundraising, stigma and equity and inclusion in, in, in resource mobilization. Uh, Dr. Hansen has more than 20 years professional experience as a fundraiser and is a former board member of AFP Chicago. Recent publications include Applying a Stakeholder Management Approach to Ethics in Char Charitable Fundraising, published in the Journal of Philanthropy and Marketing, and Gary Neighborhood House, Managing Mission and Uncertainty in the Civil Rights Era in the edited volume, Who's Your Philanthropy? Uh, she also contributed a chapter, Theory in Fundraising, to the new edition of Achieving Excellence in Fundraising. She is currently working on a co-authored article on fundraising appeal letters. And then our final uh, panelist tonight is James Conley, who is the George and Francis Ball Distinguished Professor of History and Director of the Center for Middle Sound Studies at Ball State University. He received his PhD in the History of American Civilization from Brandeis University in 1995 and came to Ball State the next year. He is an urban historian, published a book in 1998 on urban political culture in Boston, 
and another book in 2010 on city machine politics during industrialization. He also co-authored with another Ball State colleague, Frank Felsenstein, uh, What Middletown Read, using Muncie to explore print culture and cosmopolitanism uh, in, in a small city. Uh, he has received numerous fellowships, including a Fulbright Scholar Award uh, to the Free University of Berlin, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and uh, a fellowship from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. He's also been very active in the digital humanities. His current research investigates the transition from industrial to post-industrial life in the American Rust Belt. So we'll start, uh, Greg will give a little overview, then each of the panelists uh, will have uh, a few minutes, um, and then we'll have some sort of general questions and open it to the audience for their questions. So Greg. Thanks, Nicole, I appreciate the introduction and for you being here. And thanks uh, again to uh, the Indiana Historical Society the book really wouldn't exist without their engagement, you know, from the very beginning, organizing the conference that we held there. Um, and then and now as well, being supportive, it's really appreciated. Um, great to see everyone here, uh, not only uh, those of us on the panel, but also I can see some of the names of the panelists. Uh, wish I was there with you in person, but great to see you uh, online. So thanks for coming uh, tonight. So this book is really uh, emerged out of my interest in having some understanding of the tradition of giving in Indiana. And I would teach the history of philanthropy at um, Indiana University and students would kind of be interested in, in some of the background surrounding it. And I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity uh, to do that when we were coming up on the bicentennial of uh, Indiana state history uh, or the, the founding of the state, I should say. And so uh, that's really the, uh, how the book emerged. And um, one of the things though that happened as we, uh, as I began to read all the contributions and, and you know, thank you all who are here for your contributions and the many others who, who did contribute. Um, I got a sense of really that there was a kind of tradition and a kind of approach to giving in Indiana. And I think that would not have emerged without focusing in on this longer tradition. I think over the over the, the period of the 200 years, it became clearer to see some of the trends that developed in how Hoosiers gave, who they gave to, who gave, uh, really the entire process. And so essentially, uh, I make an argument that there is a type of um, a Hoosier sort of tradition of giving. It's not exceptional just to Indiana, but I think this combination of factors itself does define this approach. So starting with from the kind of the beginning of the philanthropic gift, the donors going to the recipients or beneficiaries, we can take a look at, at um, how giving in Indiana, philanthropy in Indiana has developed. And so I think there are four main points here. One is that the donor base is much broader and diverse than we normally uh, expect. Uh, number two is that Hoosiers tend to be adopters and adapters, and in fact, early adopters of innovation, so a little less so on the innovative side, but among the earliest to engage with new ideas and approaches. Um, that the means to do this is often actually through networks, so it's almost a kind of crowdsourced approach to um, philanthropic giving. And finally, that the beneficiaries are much more middle class than we've recognized and, and I think uh, uh, considered in our field. and so. All of those four points, I, I just want to develop in a, in a bit further as we go through. So Nicole started off by mentioning Calvin Fletcher, and in many ways, Calvin Fletcher is sort of the archetypical donor, a white man who's wealthy, who comes in and kind of, um, you know, goes for main kind of mainstream things like the Indiana Historical Society, goes for human services and those basic needs, uh, really kind of engages in that way. Uh, but if we were to think about the history of Indiana, we could find across gender differences, across ethnic differences, across religious differences, we would find donors in all different kind of groups. So just to name a couple of examples uh, and take the, um, the issue of gender. Um, women supported the formation of the Indiana Annapolis Museum of Art. They supported the formation of the Evansville History and Art Museum, two big, uh, you know, institutions. Um, later on, Ruth will talk about the neighborhood house in Gary, uh, which was also formed by uh, two women uh, who were going to um, help in terms of providing uh, recently immigrated workers housing. Um, Kate and Jane Williams were their names. Uh, 
Uh, I see uh, Bob Barrow's on, on here uh, in Evansville, uh, Albion Fellows Bacon, who he's written a great uh, book about, uh, helped to uh, create changes in terms of housing conditions and public-private partnerships. And so, you know, we can see a number of different towns and cities in Indiana where women played a role in, as major donors and pushing forward uh, new ideas in terms of philanthropy. And so taking that as just one example, and we can talk about others uh, later on as well. Then there comes this question of innovation and uh, how do we think about innovation versus adoption? And one of the, uh, you know, I, I think benefits or, or, or really one of the, I think, um, advantages or, or high points of the book is that we had a, a forward from Clay Robbins, who's uh, the CEO and president of the Lilly Endowment. And in the forward, he talks about the endowment's approach as being a balance between prudence and creativity. And that mixture, prudence and creativity, I think sums up really a long tradition of Hoosier giving. Uh, that what we're looking at here is in fact a, a desire to see things that are proven and to take them and make them fit for Indiana. I don't think the Lilly Endowment is the only one who did that, but I do think they've advanced that uh, ideology as well and kind of built upon that as a long-term approach to uh, taking the upside of innovation and using it uh, further along. So when we think about just a couple examples, um, so community foundations, the first community foundation in the United States was formed in Cleveland. Uh, only two years later, uh, Indianapolis formed its own community foundation. When we think about charity organization societies, which was kind of an effort to um, really make philanthropy uh, more efficient. Uh, the first one was formed in London. The first one in the US was formed in Buffalo. But two years after Buffalo, there's Indianapolis, right? So pretty quickly, these things get uh, taken up and adopted within Indiana, and they become really models then for other cities. Usually it starts with Indianapolis, and then it'll move on to, say, the Community Foundations Fort Wayne or the uh, Charitable Organization Society Richmond. But it does become a piece of um, the Indiana approach uh, to giving, and I think that's an important element um, to consider here. And, you know, in a lot of ways, this is, I think, representative more generally of philanthropic progress. There can only be so many innovators, right? Uh, innovators almost by definition, there are fewer of them. And so early adoption, though, or even just adoption of good ideas is a kind of a practice that can um, really be taken on by many other states. And I'm hopeful that uh, some other, other historians will write histories of other states that we can get a sense of that as well. Now, in terms of means, I think one of uh, mentioned the Lilly Endowment and it would be hard placed, I think, to to understand the history of philanthropy in Indiana without talking about the contributions of the Lilly Endowment. And one of the uh, way, one of the reasons I think that Indiana has such a collaborative and network based approach to philanthropic giving is because of the endowments understanding of that as being a good way to do it. And so um, when we think about the endowment, I'm, I'm going to have to read some statistics here for a second. But as of the bicentennial in 2016, the Lilly Endowment dispersed $9.4 billion to over 9,400 nonprofit organizations. Um, spurred urban development in, in Indianapolis, um, funded educational nonprofit networks. About 40% of grant dollars went to education, 37% to community building, and 34% to religious donation uh, institutions. In 2016, donors split um, uh, gifts in Indiana about equally between Indianapolis-based and the rest, although, of course, many state organizations are headquartered in Indianapolis. And so what we see here is a real commitment to giving in Indiana. And second to that, the way that many of these gifts were given out was actually by helping to create networks. And so you may have seen a piece in the Chronicle of Philanthropy recently in which Stan Katz referred to uh, the Lilly Endowment is a wholesale give, uh, donor, right? And they are, they're a wholesale donor, they can give in large gifts. But I think one of the things that they've done is they also created a retail network, right? Which is not always the case of foundations. They're not always out there creating the network to also carry out the activities. But I think in a lot of ways, the endowment did that. And so when we look at it, we look at sort of the, the support that they gave starting in 1990 for community foundations, the gift program that provided a matching grant to create community foundations in many uh, counties throughout Indiana. And virtually, well, every county is covered, even though there's not one per county, but 
every county is now covered by a community foundation. And so we have uh, really kind of seen the development of that. And, and part of the idea there goes back to a, an important concept of the endowment and of Indiana philanthropy, which is that those on the local level are best placed to make decisions about local needs. And so the community foundations are there to kind of provide one way of doing that. In addition to the community foundations, um, the Lilly Endowment also helped to fund uh, two other, I think, broad based and important networks. One, uh, what is now the Indiana Philanthropy Alliance, uh, previously the Donor Alliance, and um, what is now the um, Indiana Independent Colleges of Indiana, uh, which really kind of helps fundraise for all of those uh, smaller nonprofit and advocate for all of those smaller nonprofit colleges. And so, what they, they kind of tried to do is to create one meeting place um, for uh, institutions to come together. And again, to sort of have this network of individuals on the local level who could make decisions locally. And so having this kind of combination of network and collaborative giving, I think was a, a significant part of the endowment's approach to this. And I would say two things about that. One, it's very democratizing, right? So instead of having just the Lilly endowment making those decisions on their own, they are engaging other um, other voices in the process and especially local voices on the one hand. On the other, what we've seen in the history of Indiana, uh, or at least to date, what, what, what I think Hoosier philanthropy has shown is that those groups have tended to then find the widest common denominator. And that means often that they support middle-class mainstream interests over those of marginalized groups and um, really leads to my last point about this, which is that these beneficiaries are much more likely to be middle class than we usually realize. And so there's essentially two stereotypes about uh, who benefits from philanthropy. On the one hand, there's a kind of the traditional sense of it's the poor, it's the needy, those are the ones who are gonna get the, get the money that is needed. Um, and that philanthropy is essentially redistributive, right? That it goes from the wealthy down to the poor. On the other hand, uh, both critics of philanthropy and a couple of scholars more recently have made a killing on saying, well, actually all this is, is really the wealthy, right? It's a system to keep the wealthy in power. That's how this works. And so really what philanthropy is about is about preserving a system that allows the wealthy to keep their wealth. And sure, they give you some crumbs over here, but really what it is, is it keeping them in their place of status. What I've seen in the history of Indiana is actually that that's an incomplete story on both sides. And that what instead we have is that the beneficiaries often of philanthropic giving, the beneficiaries of nonprofit work are often middle-class individuals. And we've often left them out of the story. And we can see this in, in a number of different ways. So you think about university education, who's able to afford to go to universities. That's a, a huge area of, of, of donations and gifts. When we think about medical research as a fantastic piece in, in the volume about medical research that was supported over the years in Indiana. But who has access to healthcare? Who can then go um, and use these latest discoveries, right? And so Indiana has consistently come out among the lowest in public health outcomes from the 1990s on. And part of that reasoning is who has access to healthcare. And so when we look at these things, I think understanding that uh, the benefits of philanthropy are often there for the middle class is a key element to understanding the history of philanthropy. And I, and I would argue it really begins to um, change our understanding of what philanthropy means. Um, because when you think of philanthropy as from the wealthy to the poor, or even the middle class to the poor, you're thinking of this in a hierarchical sense, and you're not understanding the notion that it is kind of a mutually beneficial system in which those who may style themselves as donors, writing their checks to help the poor, are actually in other ways getting benefits from other aspects of philanthropic giving. And so it really kind of uh, changes, I think, the understanding of, of what philanthropy is and how it has an impact on our society. And by leaving out the middle class, I think we underestimate that uh, in our understanding of today, but also of the past. And so I'll stop there for a minute. I know we'll have some greater detail from each of our speakers and look forward to hearing uh, that as well. Thanks, Greg. And so now uh, Tyrone will uh, speak about um, 
one of the most famous philanthropists in Indiana history and other topics. Tyrone. Okay, thank you very much. And um, hello, everyone. Very happy to be here, excited for this panel. So thanks to the Historical Society and all of you for tuning in. And first, just want to uh, celebrate uh, my friend, colleague, and brother, Greg Rukowski, for the vision to put this book together and to and invite all of us to contribute to it. And I hope that there'll be 49 more volumes for the other states, but you don't have to do them, right? <laughs> Let other people do them. But paving this way, this is an important contribution, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, the, the title of my contribution is a chapter, uh, The Big-Hearted, Race-Loving Woman, uh, Madam C.J. Walker's Philanthropy in Indianapolis, 1911 to 1914. Before I jump into it, I want to take a moment and just pause and honor the memory of an important member of the IHS family uh, who was integral to my being able to do this work. Uh, the archivist Wilma Moore passed away some years ago, and she's a great steward and caretaker of all the collections at IHS. And she would sit with me for hours as I was toiling through the archives and just have conversations with me and, and a, an important thought partner in the process of doing this work in the subsequent book. And so always want to, to remember and celebrate uh, Wilma uh, for all that she has meant for the society and for Hoosier history uh, and for the field. Um, and so, so um, with, with that, uh, Madam Walker, um, many will know Madam Walker, a, a famous adopted Hoosier, um, who uh, claim to fame is being a, a self-made millionaire um, in America, labeled the first self-made female millionaire uh, because of the beauty culture business that she established here in Indianapolis, officially in 1910. Um, she had roots. She was born in Delta, Louisiana on a, a, a cotton plantation. Her family had been enslaved. Um, and so there's kind of this story that she emerges from this experience um, and, and moves around the South before landing in the Midwest. And after a, a grueling young life um, as, a, as an orphan and then as a widow and as a single mother who's grappling with a new post-Reconstruction America where Jim Crow is being assembled around her, um, begin you know, working as a washerwoman and starts to begin working in uh, beauty culture and developing her own brand of products. She marries a man named Charles Joseph Walker, which is where the CJ Walker moniker comes from, puts her name and face on the products, begins selling them to door, door to door in, in um, St. Louis and in, in Denver, Colorado, then in Pittsburgh. Then she comes to Indianapolis in 1910. And this is where um, my chapter for the, the contribution takes off because the, her story kind of takes off uh, and her impact kind of takes off, this national profile develops after she comes to Indianapolis. So Indianapolis is an important part of her story. And the title of my chapter, The Big Hearted Race Loving Woman, that comes from a resolution that was written in 1915 by the local black community in Indianapolis. 60 civic leaders from the YMCA mostly um, had written this because rumors were circulating that Madam Walker was leaving Indianapolis after six years of being a resident there. And they were devastated by this. They did not want her to go. Um, and, and so in the, in the letter, there's this wonderful language. They're calling her their daughter, um, a generous mother, uh, a benefactor, a sister, and of course, this big-hearted, race-loving woman who's meant so much to us. And please, please stay. Uh, Madam Walker was preparing to leave for New York, where she had established business operations and was building her mansion. And so they didn't want her to leave. Um, and it's a really important part, begins to reflect the way in which she used philanthropy to relate to community. So this relational model and aspect of philanthropy becomes apparent. So again, I mentioned she, mentioned she moved to Indianapolis in 1910. 10, um, after had visiting previously, she was known for traveling around the country promoting her products. But when she visited Indianapolis, the local Black community rolled out the red carpet for her. She was so impressed by the civic institutions, the Black entrepreneurship, the community. Uh, and even today, right, Indiana is known as the crossroads of America, the heartland of America. There's a notion of logistical advantage for business, um, the, the rails and all these things that were here. She decided to, to, to locate to Indianapolis. And this is where Indiana Indiana becomes an important part of her story. Um, she incorporates the business officially here in the state of Indiana. Um, she establishes the headquarters for the company, which remained throughout its, its full existence. Uh, she built the first factory here in Indianapolis. And so this really becomes her base. And even after she moves to New York, um, the company stays here 
family and friends are still here. She still is relating very much to the community and seems to look to Indianapolis as a sense of home. And when you think of someone who was orphaned and born on a slave plantation and, and then moved around the South and dealing with this, this emerging Jim Crow America, Indianapolis takes on this shape of home for someone who, who, who lacked really that sense of connectedness. Um, and, and we see critical relationships developing for her while she was here. Of the Ransom family, Freeman B. Ransom was an attorney who becomes a, a manager and eventually a leader of her company and her close confidant. And also, I argue somewhat of her, her program officer from a philanthropic standpoint. Um, the Ward family, Dr. Ward is a prominent black doctor here in Indianapolis. The Broken Burr family, another attorney. George Knox was running the Indianapolis Freedmen and they became very close. And she was rooted in local institutions like Bethel AME Church. So Indianapolis is very important. And philanthropy and supporting uh, local organizations is a big part of her story. And so um, the, one of the, the primary sources that was important for telling this story um, is a letter that um, anyone tuning in tonight can uh, look up at the IHS. Um, it is digitized now, uh, but it's a 1914 letter that a local school teacher from Indianapolis named Ella Croker sent to Freeman B. Ransom, Madam Walker's attorney. And she asked if, if he would recount for her, Madam Walker, Walker's generosity, her, her gifts to the community. And it's not clear why she wanted it or what she was doing, but it's important to note that she was affiliated with Mary Cable, who's another important educator and leader in public schools here in Indianapolis and also in starting the, the NAACP branch here in the state. And, and so um, Ransom sits down and writes her this letter where he recounts many of the gifts that Madam Walker has given over this kind of this three year period from 1911 to 1914. And from that, I use that to kind of characterize the different ways in which she was extending herself. And, and it, so it's interesting. So of course there were monetary gifts. Um, and so he mentions gifts ranging from $5 to $1,000. There's just kind of this range of giving where she's giving to organizations like the YMCA. That $1,000 gift was a, a pledge that made national headlines and billed as kind of the largest gift given by a Black person to um, uh, so this, these kinds of fun fundraising campaigns to build the, the colored or the Black YMCA for Indianapolis. Uh, she gives to Flanner House, a local institution which is still here in Indianapolis serving the, the West Side community. Um, which was a bit of a settlement house and had a range of social services going on there. And Ransom and others were on the board. And so she had close ties there. Uh, the Might Missionary Society at her previous church in St. Louis, uh, the um, uh, St. Paul's AME Church uh, received funding, as well as an orphanage in St. Louis that took care of Madeline Walker's daughter when she lived there in her early 20s uh, so that she could work. So she was very much giving to these kinds of institutions that have been helpful to her. And I'd like to say that every gift that Madam Walker made was one she once needed herself or one that she was still in needed to Greg's point about the middle class often benefiting. Uh, certainly as a poor orphan, widowed, struggling young mother, she needed social services. She lacked education because of Jim Crow. So she supported black schools, black social service agencies that were meeting this needs. And of course, as a black woman in Jim Crow America, she needed freedom and liberation. So she, of course she was on the front lines of the anti-lynching movement with the NAACP and funding the different institutions that were fighting the cause of struggle for the race. She was known to visit local families in Indianapolis who were struggling and would leave behind gifts of food and money for them. And, and she supported a range of schools across the South, like Charlotte Hawkins Brown School, the Palmer Memorial Institute in North Carolina. Um, and to Greg's point about networks, Madam Walker moved through a lot of networks, the National Association of Colored Women, uh, the Court of Calanthe, which was a fraternal order, and there was a branch here in Indianapolis that she transferred her membership to. She joined when she was living in Indi uh, in St. Louis, uh, and again in her 20s. Um, and, and so uh, she's very much networked, very much engaged. She's giving to the in International YMCA, to Alpha House, which is an important, um, quote unquote, old folks home that served African Americans here in Indianapolis. Um, and, and so just very, you know, giving of, of her financial uh, resources. But she also would give these kind of uh, non-monetary gifts. Um, so Ransom recounts that she bought wheelchairs for individuals who had disabilities, that, that she provided milk and food 
for uh, indigent families, um, that she brought uh, uh, travel tickets for people to take the train to reunite with their families, uh, which you recall is a, is a big theme after Reconstruction, after the end of slavery, where people are trying to find their families. And here, we're, we're a few decades removed from that, but there's still this notion of displacement and people trying to get, get settled going on, especially as waves of the migration uh, are starting to happen in this, this, this World War I era. Uh, she also funded legal services for Black men who were incarcerated in a accused of murder and other crimes in this kind of Jim Crow legal system. And when we think about the importance of, 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 of uh, representation in the, in the criminal justice system, we think about the rampant lynching that's going on. This is an important part of this legacy of, of philanthropy and giving. But one of the things that was notable is that she didn't give any uh, in-kind gifts of her products from her company. Um, and remember that this is before our kind of contemporary tax code where there's all types of tax breaks for these kinds of things. But according to a local Indianapolis resident, Violet Reynolds, who um, worked for Madam Walker, was hired by Madam Walker in her teens and lived into her 90s. Uh, Madam Walker was adamant that she wouldn't give away products, that there was, there was a dignity of work there, that she wanted people to buy that so that she could then do the other things. Um, so so an interesting array of her financial resources, but also these other kind of intangible ways of supporting people. But Ransom also talks about employment as a gift in this letter, which is very interesting. It's not something we think about today in this way. Um, but he, he talks about how Madam Walker is hiring people with disabilities, hiring people who are very elderly in their 80s or so, and, and hence maybe uh, physically frail and not attractive to the, to the job market, let alone being African-Americans who are locked out of Jim Crow uh, and employment markets and labor markets. And so there's this broader theme of employing the unemployable, if you will, that becomes an important part of understanding philanthropy in the Black tradition, where you're navigating these oppressive economic and political systems and trying to make sense of them. So creating these types of job and economic development opportunities gets cast as a gift um, in the way now that we, we, we may think about social benefit corporate Operations and, and social entrepreneurship is having this double benefit or multiple benefits to, to business enterprise. Um, and then the last point is um, institution building, that um, Ransom talks about her being supportive of this idea of building schools and especially an industrial school in Africa. And this goes back to a vision that Madam Walker had of building the Tuskegee of Africa. She was uh, someone who revered Booker T. Washington, the famous early 20th century Black leader uh, who started Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, controversial for its industrial vocational form of education. Um, but prolific in terms of establishing these institutions, thousands of them across the South. And, and Walker valued what he was doing. She gave money to Tuskegee and she supported that work and she wanted to put her own stamp on this and develop one for, for Africa. She tried to do that, it didn't work. She even left money in her will uh, to try to start that institution, but, but it didn't happen. But, but there's again, this, this denial of education that she experienced and knowing that education is important for freedom made her become an important funder of black education. And so uh, this gives us an opportunity to think about how she used philanthropy uh, to not to relate to her local community, to certainly build up the profile of her business, but also be connected in this larger tradition of the Black struggle for freedom and how she thought about her company as a race company. There's this tradition from this era of many uh, middle-class African-American leaders thinking about themselves as race men or race women. And what they meant by that is that they were fighting the struggle for freedom on behalf of the Black race. And so for Walker to kind of cast the company as a race company, Company speaks to this same kind of ethos that 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 this kind of, of business can be put into service to the race for larger cause, causes beyond individual economic benefit. And so altogether, this gives us ways of thinking about some important themes um, in the field, this notion of charity versus philanthropy. Um, you know, sometimes we think about this debate where, where charity is this, this impulsive, religiously inspired, emotional uh, attempt to give interpersonally to alleviate one person's suffering versus philanthropy is supposed to be more systematic, organized, and thinking at a macro level. But we see Walker operating at both levels, giving money to individuals. We see her working in networks to bring down Jim Crow, fighting against lynching. And it's important to also pause and reflect that we're thinking at a time where the three sectors, as we think about it, public, private, nonprofit, aren't really working for African-Americans. There's not kind of a legacy or, or, or leisure to think about 
kind of this separateness because right government has upholded slavery and instituting Jim Crow. The private markets are are maintaining discrimination and even our beloved nonprofit sector right won't accept black children at social service agencies. Schools are discriminatory and all these kinds of things. So what do you do when all three sectors are complicit in your oppression? You turn inward. You build your own. And so Madam Walker is kind of operating across these distinctions that have become important to Western philanthropy, but not so much in this 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 black women's tradition of giving. And then the, the tenets of scientific philanthropy, Greg mentioned the Charity Organization Society earlier. Um, we see um, Walker uh, not really dabbling in that. We see a different notion of who counts as a worthy a recipient of giving as a contrast to that movement, which had very strict protocols with, with who should be supported and who shouldn't be. Again, this notion when you're in a system that is oppressing and you you are, even though you're this millionaire, you still could be lynched, you still could be violated. You need freedom just like anyone, any other African-American. Those labels and those models don't necessarily play out the same way. We see an expanded gift of notions uh, of giving. Um, again, this is before our modern tax code. So, um, you know, many things can be a gift. And again, when you talk about a community that's being intentionally deprived, there are many things that it needs. So, we can look beyond money uh, to other forms of, of giving and gener generosity that are very important. And then this idea of, of challenging the, the notion of that there should be social distance between giver and recipient. We see Walker giving to, to family, to friends, to people within her company, and to quote unquote strangers, where again, the Western tradition is saying, no, you're not supposed to know who's benefiting from your gift. You're not supposed to be connected to them in any meaningful way, and certainly not in order to claim a tax deduction. So we see Walker's giving, particularly what she's doing here in Indianapolis, being rooted in culture and identity as a Black woman, uh, very much focused on racial uplift, supporting women, supporting education and social services, the kinds of things that she was denied as a poor orphan, widowed young mother. And then we see Indianapolis and the state of Indiana being an important part of this story, because this is the place where she found community and connection, where she set down roots. She lived in eight different places during her lifetime, but it was Indiana that she kind of perpetually returned to. She didn't really go back back to Delta, Louisiana. She visited once, but she didn't really say much about it in her archive. But she repeatedly, even when she goes to New York, she repeatedly comes back to, to Indianapolis. And of course, that's where the company is. And, and that legacy continues. The subsequent generations in her family were based here in Indianapolis, and the company maintained um, its roots here. So it's an important place to understand the Hoosier state in her story. Uh, she very much has been adopted by Hoosiers, but she made it her community as well and was embraced. And philanthropy was a big part of that story, because that's how how she maintained those relationships and those connections. So I'll pause there and, and pass it off to uh, the next presenter. Okay, thank you, Tyrone. So uh, Tyrone's talked a lot about community uh, and uh, Ruth's contribution to the volume was on the Gary Neighborhood House. So Ruth. Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much everybody for being here and uh, engaging in this discussion. Um, so my chapter is focused more on mid-century and, and, and primarily the 1960s. Um, excuse me, I'm so sorry. I'm just getting over a bout of influenza and it's still in my lungs. So I'm sorry I'm not, you know, speaking without coughing. Um, so, so my chapter is called, yeah, Gary Neighborhood House, Managing Mission and Uncertainty in the Civil Rights Era. And as you heard when we were talking about the biographies, my primary background is not as a historian. Primarily, my background came as a fundraiser. And that means asking questions like, where does money come from? Where does money go to? And who benefits from that money? Um, other questions that come up are things like, when there is uncertainty, when you're in volatile times, how is that going to affect what causes wind up being resourced, right? So, <coughs> excuse me. So this is this is very much a lens that I brought to looking at the Gary Neighborhood House. Now, the Gary Neighborhood House was established 1906, uh, one of the first uh, certainly social service agencies in Gary, which was established in 1901, right? So they gave they gave a, a bit of a head start there and then said, boom, it's us. 
Um, and yes, as, as Greg mentioned, it was established actually by a couple of sisters who were not from Gary. I mean, it's five years after the city was founded. Really, nobody was from Gary at that point, right? They came in and right off the bat, working through networks, working with the Presbyterian Church, the local Presbytery, the broader, um, <coughs> excuse me, church structure. With the initial idea, let's found a kindergarten. And but we're open to whatever's needed, right? Um, so you fast forward several years, the Presbyterian Church uh, at this time really has and, and actually continues to have uh, just a real commitment towards progressive social action as a religious imperative, right? As part of this idea of the dignity of humankind. And this winds up having a very strong impact on how the neighborhood house develops. It, um, it adapts to the, the changing uh, demographics of the area. Uh, this becomes, um, uh, Gary, Gary becomes one of the most uh, racially segregated cities in the entire United States, certainly in the Northern United States. Um, it's up there with Birmingham, Alabama which is of course not in the North, it's up there with Chicago. I hear right now Milwaukee is uh, vying for that, which really calls into question my choices of where I've chosen to live. Um, but uh, this brings really some crisis, right? And then you look at the 1960s, you look at the civil rights movement, you look at people are not being quiet about uh, you know, certainly racial injustices, it's being called into a further crisis mode. So that's really the part that I focus on. At this point in the early, <coughs> excuse me, the early 1960s, the, uh, the previous uh, director of Neighborhood House is retiring. The board decides to do a search that is national. It's not just local. And they hire in Reverend William Brooks, who uh, was schooled in Atlanta, Georgia, Gammon Theological Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia. And so he's educated in the 1950s um, in a community organizing tradition, which was, you know, really still fairly uncommon in the 1950s. The board of the Gary Neighborhood House decides that this is what they want. They want an African-American, somebody who has this theological background, somebody who is going to take a very community-oriented approach. And um, I've, I've been asked to specifically focus on the idea of networks, and how that speaks to progressive ideas and trying to advance those progressive ideas. Well, <coughs> excuse me, Reverend Brooks was a big fan of networks. In fact, I'm, I'm convinced that he probably woke up and just started thinking about, you know, who he was going to connect with on that day. Um, and this is something that worked very well. I mean, Neighborhood House had started off with really working through the Presbyterian Church. They wound up then collaborating with the other settlement houses. There were a total of four settlement houses in Gary. Um, while Reverend Brooks was there, he was very focused on this idea of working with people in the community, finding out what people in the community need, finding out what people in the community can contribute, which is very much an idea of reciprocity, a very reciprocal approach to philanthropy. This is something that tied in really well with that Presbyterian Church sponsorship, where even though most of the funding was coming from other wealthier churches, there was still this expectation that there would be engagement like on the ground. So uh, sure, Neighborhood House would get some money, but then they would also engage with people from these other congregations who would come over and broaden their horizons as well, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. While Reverend Brooks was, I need just a moment, sorry. Sorry about that. <coughs> 
Well, Reverend Brooks was um, leading the neighborhood house, pretty much every aspect of neighborhood house expanded. The budgets expanded, the board size expanded, the programs expanded. He was also a joiner himself. And so we find that um, at, uh, the United Fund it had been previously the community chest, now it's the United Way, winds up taking on a greater and greater portion of funding of the programs because they're probably some of the deepest pockets around who are interested in these social services. So at this point, you have the largest funders of Neighborhood House being the Presbyterian Church congregations, the Presbytery, and also um, the United Fund. And, and you know neither of these are probably going to make our list of elite donors for the state of Indiana or for the country, right? But this is who we have paying, paying the bills, right? Um, and uh, while we're there, he, he then leverages this. He makes sure that his employees get professional training uh, through, through uh, associations like the Chicago Federation of Settlement Houses. He brings in uh, partnerships with the Visiting Nurses Association, with Planned Parenthood, with Meals on Wheels. But one of the things that's really distinctive as well is that the neighborhood house decides it's not sufficient to put band-aids on wounds. They actively go and, for example, criticize the city of Gary for its, quote, systematic neglect of the city's poorest residents, you know, saying the quiet part out loud, right? So at this point, they've decided if they're really going to be of service to their community, they can't just keep their heads down, right? So this brings in, there's, there, there are some challenges to working with networks and working collaboratively. And I'll tell you, when I started digging into the archives, which in my case was, was uh, the Calumet archives up in Gary, um, there was a note on the file that said, you know, dissolve, sometime in the early 70s due to insufficient funding. Well, if you're just reading the ledgers, that sounds like it's a failure. You know, hey, just couldn't convince people to give money. As you read more deeply though, you see that the tensions that are there are largely contextual. Things like the crisis of the civil rights era, um, the crisis of what that looks like in a city that is as segregated as Gary is. But you also come to these really more fundamental um, issues of, of what are we going to prioritize, our mission or our resources, where they're in conflict. We see issues uh, like one of the hot issues right now in the fundraising community is, um, do we should we be donor centered fundraising? Should we be community centered fundraising? And yes, ideally, you find a sweet spot where that's not in conflict, but sometimes it's in conflict. One of the other tensions that we see here is really the tension between innovation and conflict avoidance. And the founding impetus of that Presbyterian church was, we are going to engage in social action, in change, in hiring Reverend Brooks. He was very much a change maker. He's very much somebody who grounded in the community and said, well, let's make it right then. What can we do to actually make change? And that's not just within the confines of our annual budget. That's let's go out and find other partners who have some similar um, missions. You know, it doesn't have to be the whole mission. It could be, we overlap in this area, let's work there. And yes, let's work with the United Fund as well. Um, 
the United Fund turned out to be an enabler in terms of funding, but also a constraint. And if you look at the history of the United Fund at this time, the way that they tended to engage with the, the charities that they funded was more of a structural engagement. It was less of a hands-on getting to know the community engagement and more of a, gosh, you know what would make really good financial sense is if you guys all consolidate kind of engagement. Oh, and by the way, we have the power of the purse. So when we say we really think you should do this, we're not paying for the other option. Um, and so this wound up being where those networks served to really advance the mission in ways that were not tied to keeping the organization as it was. Yeah, the organization ceased to exist as an isolated organization in the early 70s. And yes, it was because they didn't have adequate funding for what they wanted to do. But they found other ways of expressing the mission through setting up active, uh, excuse me, through setting up neighborhood training institutes, through helping to fund a legal uh, clinic, through helping to bring about political change. Uh, one of the things that I, I haven't even touched on so far, you wanna talk innovation. Um, Gary was one of the first major US cities to vote in uh, an African-American mayor. Um, shortly after that, Gary was a model city at the federal level, supposed to be an urban laboratory for the nation. At the same time, the federal civil rights bill passed in 1964, and it wasn't until 1965 that Gary City Council finally managed to pass their civil rights omnibus bill that actually meant that there was open housing, which actually meant that people could live anywhere throughout the city. And it was hotly contested. That was not the kind of conflict avoidance that the United Fund had in mind. So when you start talking about networks, it's important to remember that networks are rarely homogenous, that you often find um, something that most of the people in the room agree with. But if you are looking for something everybody agrees with, it's probably not going to be the innovative answer. So I will stop right there. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Okay, so I know uh, Ruth has talked about fundraising and her background in fundraising. I know uh, Jim has done some fundraising, but tonight he's going to talk about uh, voluntary associations. Thank you, Nicole. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks also to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, uh, I really appreciate Greg's work on this from the very beginning back, um, you know, it was almost 10 years ago, I think, when we first started talking about doing this work. So uh, it's it's been a long process in some respects, but I'm I'm delighted that we now have a book uh, to show for our labors. Uh, uh, thanks as well to the Indiana Historical Society for organizing this event, and of course for organizing the conference uh, that from which this book originated uh, back in 2016. And and certainly thanks to IU Press and all this. And thanks to my colleague Nicole for for moderating tonight uh, and joining us, and and to, to my colleagues here on the panel. Um, <clears throat> My uh, my charge from Greg back when we first began to talk about this was to provide a, an examination, a history of associational and voluntary activity in Indiana from the, the early 19th century when Indiana formed as a state on through to the present or at least to the recent past. And so the idea here was to focus on the ways in which people gave their time, their energy, their attention to various causes rather than how they, they gave money. Uh, I think Greg approached me. He's he, we were colleagues for some time, and uh, uh, he was aware that I had done work on uh, a public life, particularly urban public life in the United States, both sort of conventional politics, but also organizational activities and how those two things connected. Um, in 2016, I had just finished with my colleague Frank Felsenstein, 
a, a book called What Middletown Read, uh, which examined the history of the Muncie Public Library and drew on circulation records that we had to figure out who was reading what. But, but we spent a considerable amount of time in that project examining uh, the ways in which various voluntary groups came together to organize the library, even though in some senses it was a public endeavor, it was also a private enterprise uh, um, sponsored by lo the local business community, which did fundraising, eventually supported by Andrew Carnegie as part of his library philanthropy. Uh, there was heavy involvement from local women's organizations. Uh, working men's groups and labor unions were lobbying the, 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 the library to uh, shape its collections. And so there's a great deal of associational activity that, that emerged around the process of creating a library in Muncie, Indiana. We call the book What Middletown Read in reference to Muncie's status as the subject of the, the, the famous Middletown studies. Um, so uh, Greg thought I'd be well positioned to, to provide an overview of, of, of civic life in Indiana. That was perhaps a bit optimistic, uh, but uh, I appreciate his faith in me uh, nonetheless. Uh, so, so what I did was I, I put together uh, an essay that uh, divided the history of, of associational life and voluntary activity in Indiana into three periods. Uh, uh, the first period was the, the from the founding of the state in 1816 through to about the 1870s, the end of Reconstruction. Uh, the second period focused on what I call the industrial era, the period from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, uh, when Indiana at first rapidly industrialized and, and remained uh, a state that was characterized by an industrial co economy to a considerable extent, although there's there's a strong agricultural presence as well, of course. Uh, and then looking at, uh, for lack of a better term, what I call the post-industrial period uh, from about 1960 uh, forward. Um, and since we're you know, trying to emphasize the 20th century, I'll move quickly through the, the earlier period and, and sort of focus a bit more on uh, the industrial and post-industrial uh, periods. But it is worth noting that uh, in this early era, this period uh, from the state's founding to through the Civil War and Reconstruction, uh, there are some patterns that get set that uh, continue to characterize Indiana's associational life in uh, the periods uh, following the Civil War and Reconstruction. So the, the first thing to note is that in, in many ways, civic life in Indiana is racially bounded. You know, amongst the, the first things people uh, in Indiana do Hoosiers do in Indiana is remove Indians, right? So they create racial boundaries from the very beginning about who's a citizen, who is, is uh, able to participate uh, in civic life. And those boundaries are always there and present and, and often contested uh, through this. Uh, associational life in the, in the pre-Civil War period was dominated by uh, urban middle classes uh, who are engaged usually in uh, philanthropic work that's organized uh, around Christian ideals, perhaps the most characteristic kind of associational activity in early and mid 19th century Indiana was uh, um, uh, uh, temperance campaigns, right? Uh, in, and these were designed as moral reforms that were designed to improve the community and to benefit or ordinary people, particularly poor people, uh, but involved middle class people providing uh, this kind of assistance. And so organizational activity around these kinds of ideals prevailed in many uh, Hoosier communities in the, the early and mid 19th century. So you had a Sabbatarian movement, you had anti, um, you had some anti-slavery activity, it wasn't as extensive as it is in some other states. This is also the period when you see mass parties emerge as voluntary organizations. Churches are a constant um, and will remain a constant. And you, I think you heard just in, in the discussions about Gary or about Indianapolis in the early 20th century, the, the significance of churches in, in, in various communities uh, around the state. Um, and so the, the civic life of the of, of this period was pretty, there's pretty much dominated by a consensus built around Christian or evangelical values uh, in, in this period. And if there was a cleavage or a tension in, in the period, it was between uh, urban moralizers and, and rural Indianans who had a very strong sort of personal libertarian streak and didn't appreciate uh, being told what to drink or how to behave uh, in, in this era. Uh, so that's the that's the first period, and, and the patterns you see established in this era persist into the the late nineteenth and, and twentieth century in a number of different ways. Uh, the second period I, I examined was the industrial era, roughly the eighteen eighties to about nineteen sixty, let's say. Um, and the thing that characterizes civic life in this period is just a, a rapid growth of organizational activity. There's a just extraordinary expansion of groups, organizations, associations, voluntary activities that are taking place uh, 
uh, across the state, particularly in, in urban settings, cities and towns, but, but really across the state uh, altogether. Uh, it's an increasingly networked uh, form of activity. You have, just, for instance, women's clubs that are organized at the local level, uh, many of whom join the Indiana Federation of Women's Clubs, which is a constituent part of the General Fe Federation of Women's Clubs, a national organization. So these connective tissues run between uh, the um, um, the local organizations all the way up to these uh, national organizations that, that wield considerable influence uh, around the country. And you could describe the same thing if you thought about fraternal organizations. You know, we heard a, a, a bit about a, a few fraternal organizations in some of the earlier presentations. Uh, and these two were local organizations, but, but were part of national networks. And so their members were uh, empowered in, in, in various ways uh, by this. The other thing to note about this flourishing of civic activity was that it was segregated in many respects, segregated by race, but also segregated increasingly by class, segregated to some extent by faith, by religious uh, affiliation. Um, and so you saw separate uh, civic networks and civic organizations organized by, uh, by by Indiana Blacks, for instance. And we heard a bit about uh, Madam C.J. Walker's uh, participation in uh, a, a local fraternal group and its role in, in uh, anchoring her to, to Indianapolis. And, and, and those kinds of institutions are, are, are really spread across the, straight, uh, across the state for Black Americans. If you move into the 20s, 30s, 40s, the region up around Gary, you start to see a the um, uh, migration of Mexican workers into the steel industry. They organize their own associations, their own institutions uh, uh, as well. So you start to see this flourishing or you continue to see this flourishing of uh, associational activity through the middle of the 20th century, but it runs along these uh, siloed tracks, right? You have, you have uh, associational life for, for black Hoosiers, you have associational life for various ethnic and religious groups. Uh, and of course you have uh, a very large amount of associational activity amongst white middle-class Hoosiers uh, in this period who are joining the Rotaries and the Odd Fellows uh, and, and the women's clubs and all kinds of other organizations through this period. And here again, the church is a constant as a sort of an anchor for, for many kinds of associational activity. It continues to be uh, an important set of institutions. The other institution that emerges as especially important for associational activity are, are labor unions. They become uh, the, the, they themselves are voluntary groups, but they also spin off other kinds of working class organizations uh, that form their own set of networks uh, that connect working class people to each other across uh, local and regional boundaries and, and, and ultimately across national boundaries uh, as well. And, and the one thing I would start, I would emphasize here, and, and this uh, is, is a spin off of what Greg emphasized earlier about the ways in which the middle class benefits from civic activity or philanthropic activity. Uh, the, the benefits that flow to middle class recipients through things like institutions such as universities or hospitals uh, and so forth is one form of uh, uh, or one way in which the middle class profit from uh, philanthropy. Another way is in which uh, they use civic organizations as a ways to define themselves as members of the middle class uh, and to sort of establish their bona fides as members of the middle class. And this is happening in black communities, this is happening in uh, 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 in, in white communities, it's, it's happening, you know, you know, there's a whole sort of network, for instance, of, of, of Jewish community organizations um, uh, and all and participation in these kinds of voluntary activities are ways of asserting and defining oneself uh, as a member of a particular group, but particularly and probably most importantly is uh, a way of asserting and defining middle class membership. So it's not just being middle class causes you to join these organizations. Uh, these participating in these organizations makes you uh, part of the middle class. Uh, and so that 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 process uh, uh, takes place constantly through this this period from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. The last period I talked about in the essay focused on the post-industrial era. We need a better name for this period, but that's what we've got for the moment. Um, and there, there's, a, there's a couple of big trends that, that reshape the, the civic uh, realm of, uh, of Indiana. The first of these is um, that formal barriers uh, to participation in various kinds of civic groups begin to, to diminish, right? And so by the time you get to the late 20th century and the early 21st century, um, you don't have separate fraternal groups for blacks and whites. You, you don't, at least not to the same extent. Um, um, you, you see uh, cross-racial membership in uh, groups like the Rotary uh, or a women's club, uh, things like that, in a way that you didn't see uh, in, in the earlier period. 
Uh, the other the other big pattern change is that participation in these kinds of organizations diminishes uh, as well. You know, or, uh, fraternal groups are now struggling for memberships uh, around the state and around the country. Uh, participation in uh, party politics, another kind of voluntary activity, has diminished dramatically uh, over the past half century or so. Participation in um, uh, uh, churches and church attendance has diminished as well. So while churches are still a, a significant presence in the civic life of the state, um, overall church uh, attendance and participation isn't um, uh, as strong as it once was. So this general trend, which reflects national trends, is evident in, in Indiana. Um, <clears throat> And uh, the result of these changes is is kind of a, a, a class and educational division over the last 50 or 60 years, uh, where you see middle class participation in, in various kinds of civic organizations at a higher level than you see working class uh, participation. The, the Basically, the decline and almost uh, uh, elimination of unions in Indiana has really undercut working class civic participation. Uh, over the last uh, century. So here again, you see a, a class division and, and, and benefits flowing to the middle class in certain ways as a result of participation in these kinds of groups. Uh, but it's, it's a, a set of benefits that it has diminished for working class Hoosiers uh, in, in the last period. Uh, the other interesting thing I noticed or, or came across in terms of, of the nature of civic participation and voluntary activity is there's a lot more of it that's it's kind of event-based, one and done is the, is the way it was described in one instance, where somebody shows up and volunteers. The great example in Indiana in the early 21st century was uh, volunteering to support the Super Bowl. Why the NFL, the, one of the richest organizations in the world, needed thousands of volunteers to work for free to help stage this event, we don't know. But Hoosiers stepped up and did that, and there was an enormous uh, participation. Uh, but there's, that's a different kind of civic activity than joining the Elks or the or the Rotary and, and going to regular meetings and becoming the treasurer and and so on. So there's a different kind of civic engagement uh, through this period. Uh, and it's one that really tracks along the kind of educational and class divisions that we see so strongly evident um, in contemporary politics. So that was my sort of quick overview of uh, the history of civic life in Indiana. Um, I'll let Greg decide whether he, he made a wise choice in in suggesting that that, that I do it. Um, I did say in the essay that there was really three things that distinguish uh, uh, Indiana's uh, civic history. Uh, the first of these is the role of industry in shaping society and, and, and particularly shaping class differences and class divisions. That's been really important. Uh, the settlement pattern is, uh, is, is, is also notable. Indiana, other than Indianapolis, which is a uh, you know, sort of a sprawling big city. You have lots of smaller cities relatively evenly dispersed around the state. Um, and this might be Indiana's superpower going forward because these are places where you, rural meets urban uh, in, in ways that, um, you know, might create opportunities to pull people together across uh, various kinds of civic, political, social divisions uh, that are ev evident now. Um, and uh, there's really no way, finally, to tell the history of this uh, this aspect of uh, Hoosier life without really considering the role of race and ethnocentrism and and who's in, who's out, and how people are sorted uh, on the basis of racial and ethnic differences. Uh, uh, and so the one thing I appreciate about this in terms of doing this on, on a state level as opposed to uh, locally or nationally or, or some other patterns, it, it does really afford us a way to to measure uh, or to assess the interplay of these kinds of big patterns around demography, around the economy, around uh, social patterns, and uh, philanthropic activity, whether it involves giving time or giving money. So so I'll leave it there, and uh, I think we get to open up for questions now, and unless Greg has a rebuttal. So thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I think our procedure now, I'll point out that uh, you can find in the chat, Casey and Bethany have been putting in links to the books and uh, the, the letter uh, from Freeman Ransom that uh, Tyrone mentioned. Uh, so you can go to the chat and find those. And also uh, we have a few sort of opening questions for the panel, uh, but uh, while we're doing that, yes, if you have, um, uh, questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box and they will get passed on and asked. Um, so to kind of begin the conversation, uh, this is the first, this volume that Greg edited is the first statewide scholarly history. 
of philanthropy. And Tyrone mentioned we should have one for all the other 49 states. Um, so the questions of the panelists are, what can we learn about phil philanthropy through the lens of a state? And perhaps if we want to um, go in the order of the panelists, so Greg. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to start. And, and you know, I think the selection process wasn't exactly scientific, right? I happened to be there and therefore chose Indiana. Um, and, you know, just a brief background, I guess, about the two sections. We did commission a couple of, um, of the studies that were really kind of broader overviews and, and, and Jim's was among those. Um, there was one on religion, there's one more broadly on the history of, of uh, civil society and philanthropy in Indiana's uh, political history, um, another on medical research and another on education. And so we did have kind of a mix there of different, um, <clears throat> different really sectors. They're, they're generally speaking the, the largest sectors of philanthropic engagement historically, and that was sort of the basis for, for those choices, human services as well, sorry, it's the last one. But, um, <clears throat> So yeah, so that, I think that was part of it. And then the other uh, contributions, those that Ruth and Tyrone had uh, were more submitted in a br broader open process and then um, and then sort of through and chosen based on um, fit for the, for the book as well as uh, quality, obviously. Um, so just about the state lens and, and you know, so I, as I said, I, I, there were some obvious reasons to choose Indiana that went beyond any kind of uh, evaluation, but I do think the history of Indiana brings together a nice uh, mixture of agricultural as well as industrial. Jim sort of referenced this, and and so you can see different patterns develop there as well. Um, from the standpoint of why there aren't more of these, and in some ways I'm surprised. Um, you know, we hear the sense the old the old adage that the states were the laboratories of democracy. And, you know, for a long time, going back to Tocqueville, um, philanthropy and civic participation, volunteerism were tied together with building democracy. And yet we really don't have many studies of this uh, on the state level. And so it's sort of surprising, given that, you know, it's state law that regulates and oversees nonprofits. The vast majority of giving is local. Um, and again, uh, for whatever reason, we, we just haven't seen it. Um, I would I would imagine one of the reasons is it's a lot of digging on a detailed level and you know I had the great fortune of having many colleagues who could do that. And then I could help come together and synthesize, but I do think some of the arguments that I make about um, the Hoosier approach to giving I, I would not have otherwise had if we didn't have all that background and that focal point on on just a state and so I do think there are some some broader uh, lessons that we can take for philanthropy and understanding. Um, the history of philanthropy based on just focusing in on this one state. So I, you know, I appreciate also the contributions other folks said in that direction, but I'll, I'll turn it over to whoever wants to go next. Uh, Tyrone? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that I think it's important when you hear the mix of, of the papers here or chapters from this panel, and then when you see the volume, it gives us a chance to rethink the, the origins and development of Indiana, right? It wasn't one group's project, it's a collective project and, and I think beautifully demonstrated by by the last presentation from Jim that you know everybody was creating these associations everybody was seeking to engage notions of of who counts and who's a citizen and who's not these things were deeply contested and so and when you think about that in the larger there's a number of histories that have come out recently um, over the past decade in particular where people are rethinking the American founding and looking at the role of of Africans and indigenous peoples and and arriving immigrants and recasting our founding story through their experiences. I think there's an opportunity here to, to, to this, this book is doing that. And, and again, moving us towards that idea that philanthropy is part of our common collective human heritage and it doesn't belong to one group or one small slice, but it's something that all of us have contributed something to in some way. Um, and, and I think that's important for really understanding what it is how it works, what it has contributed, the harm it has done, the, the good it has done. Um, and, and so telling a more inclusive and, and presenting a more inclusive um, engagement with philanthropy, I think is so important. And that's another thing that I think this, this volume and, and, and a state approach can help us and take into account nuances of geography and culture and, and migration patterns and, and larger economic and social forces as they play out differently. We know different parts of the United States 
can be very different uh, in terms of those features, the culture, um, you know, uh, historical developments and what, what factors were more important. And, and we know philanthropy is shaped by all of those different things. So I, I think uh, that that's something that in particular the state lends, um, lends itself to. All right, thank you. So uh, Ruth, did you want to add something about a state lens? Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I, I tend to be a bit more of a, 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 well, I shouldn't say more of, considering the, the company I'm keeping today. I tend to be a bit of a context junkie, right? Trying to understand somebody's environment, to understand what they're perceiving, to understand the decisions that they're making. Um, and and that's that's really where I resonate. But just because that's what I follow in terms of trying to figure out how does how does this all go together, doesn't mean that it's not you know within a a, a, a Lake County Indiana voting context or a Greater Chicago Area Professional Development context, and. So even though I was focused more on what what are these people in Gary thinking about, I think having it as part of a collected volume just allows you to hold all of those pieces together and say, huh, looking at it this way, there are some different through lines, um, as, as my colleagues have said. Thank you. So Jim? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Tyrone really nailed it a, a minute ago, right? It's uh, I really liked the the scale of of this kind of a project. And, you know, my assignment was was a, sort of a statewide overview. So it's really the first thing I've ever written that wasn't either focused on a specific community or focused on the whole country, right? It's this or or on a big region. Uh, so this was a sort of an a intermediate scale that allows you to assess a lot of these patterns, but also pull out things that are particularly distinctive to a place. And so it was it was interesting in that way, and I think valuable in that way as well. Okay. Uh, again, I'll remind people if you uh, can be entering questions in the chat or in the Q&A as we go on. Um, so uh, I'll, Tyrone will start off this next round. So do you uh, think that this study challenges the, the idea, the popular notion that the Midwest lacks distinctiveness? Wow. Um... <laughs> Midwest lacks distinctiveness. Um, well, you know, I think, you know, going back to my um, subject, I mean, I, I think there was something distinctive that in, in kind of compelled this woman, Madam Walker, to make it her home. Um, again, someone who in some ways is homeless, who in some ways is kind of born into difficult circumstances and, and has a sense of rootlessness as she's searching for freedom and moving around the South. And um, But I, it, it means something in the trajectory of that story that she sets down roots here. And, and part of it, and a big part of that was the way in which the, the local Black community received her. Um, and welcomed her and the way in which she then could respond to that and engage that and become deeply, deeply embedded in, in this community and in its institutions, so much so that they're begging her not to leave and they're, they're not successful in, in convincing her to stay. But again, it, it remains a critical part of her imagination, her identity, and certainly her family's legacy is still here to this day. Um, Alilia Bundles is, is a friend of the Historical Society and another trailblazer who for whom my work would not be possible without her and her family's legacy, this Madam Walker's great, great granddaughter for those who may not know and, and an award-winning journalist in her own right, right? That, that, that legacy was here throughout the, the rest of the 20th century because of that. And we know the impact of the company on some of the Northern black suburbs that emerged, these little pockets, these enclaves of neighborhoods where the executives of the company and things would live. And the, the resultant impact of their civic engagement, Freeman Ransom goes on to become a statewide political leader and, and civil rights leader. So I, you know, so I think that there was something that allowed her as someone again, who lived in eight different places, but the strongest connections seem to remain with Indianapolis and St. Louis, where, um, again, another kind of parallel community with strong, a strong black communities, strong civic institutions that are instrumental to her story. So, so I think you know she kind of gives us a way of thinking about that because it, it came to be a place that that in many ways symbolized home for her, um, and, and so I think that that might provide some insight into to this interesting question. All right, thank you. Uh, Ruth, do you have some insights on the distinctiveness issue? Yeah, well, I mean, a couple of things that, that I touched on 
uh, Gary was a place to watch during the civil rights era, right? I actually have an uncle who moved from Barbados to the United States to study journalism to because he was inspired by what was going on in Gary. And I didn't find that out until I was already working on this project. And then, and then you know, we had some discussions we hadn't had before. And um, I think that when you have, you know, when, when you have a city that has been designated a model city, an urban laboratory for the nation, right off the bat, that is distinctive. I think that when you have one of them, and you know, you don't necessarily want to be distinctive by being one of the most racially segregated cities, but you're also one of the first major cities in the country to to elect an African American mayor. That is also distinctive. The conversations that were happening across the country were happening in Gary and and the fact that it was so distinctive, right? Means that um this wasn't a this wasn't a quiet thing that that we just don't mention. It it means that it provided a crucible really to have some conversations, to seek ways uh, you know, of finding, okay, where are some things we have in common? Oh, okay, we all care about the environment. We all care about, we don't want U.S. steel polluting the lake. Maybe that's something that we can all focus on as having a common interest in. Um, so I think that there are some things that are very distinctive that doesn't mean that they're unique. It means that that mixture of chemicals and that level of heat uh, might have called out patterns that were quite brightly colored. Interesting. I like the distinction between distinctiveness and uniqueness. Uh, Jim? Yeah, I just add there's an emerging body of scholarship that really emphasizes the ways in which the Midwest is a distinctive region, as distinctive in its own right as the South or the West or other regions. And I think this project fits nicely in with that and illustrating some of the ways in which the patterns we see in, in, Indiana, in Indiana and in the Midwest are reflective of broader national patterns, but are shaped and influenced by, by local and regional circumstances uh, to a certain degree. So, yeah, I, I think you know, we're moving that ball forward here. Okay, thank you. So, Greg? Yeah, so I, I, you know, kind of picking up on some of that, um, one of the notions was that this is, uh, you know, um, John Lauk has a sense of the Midwest as a lost region and um, that there is no distinction there and therefore, you know, there's nothing that stands out. And, you know, it, it's a real contrast and, and Jim, of course, uh, as the head of the Middletown uh, Study Center knows this as well. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, uh, people have tried to make Indiana seem typical as well, and Muncie uh, certainly, but also Indiana more generally in a lot of ways as kind of typical Midwestern and, and the like. And so, you know, I think it's hard to stand out when you're on the one hand trying to be the 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 norm, um, and on the other, um, you know, kind of uh, looking for for the individual elements of it. But I will say, you know, looking at this uh, at the state history, I think. A couple things did stand out that both met with that kind of broader norm, or at least among some, which is the sense of kind of using limited government to provide for the public good. It's been, of course, a part of conservative ideology, and Indiana clearly fits within that uh, political spectrum. Um, and I think that kind of helps in, in terms of understanding philanthropy, because people have also often argued the nonprofit sector is kind of a parallel track to the public and or government sector. And, and I think that's one of the reasons we do see a very well-developed networked uh, uh, separate track here in Indiana. And so, um, so that, you know, there are some elements there that um, maybe are more extreme than in other places and therefore more distinctive in that sense, um, uh, but in other ways fit into, into larger patterns. I think uh, on the whole though, Again, we'll, we need to see more from other other states to have a real sense of how distinctive this philanthropic history is. 
Thank you. Uh, Jim mentioned uh, the new scholarship in Midwestern history and Greg mentioned John Locke. I just uh, will point out because I have it on my desk too. John Locke's new book, The Good Country, A History of the American Midwest, uh, really in the 1800s, 1800 to 1900. I have it on my desk because I'm uh, supposed to review it. I've only just started reading it. Um, but uh, yes, uh, John Locke was uh, very um, instrumental in re uh, reviving a field of Midwestern history uh, through the Midwestern History Association um, and through the journal, uh, the Middle West Review. So yes, there is a renaissance now in Midwestern history as, as Jim indicated. Um, so the, uh, the next question, which we'll start with Ruth, um, how is Indiana representative or not representative of uh, perhaps of uh, philanthropical traditions? Yeah, um, I think that we see some of the same tensions in Indiana nonprofits and Indiana philanthropy that we see cropping up across the country, that we see cropping up uh, you know, certainly in some other cultures as well. Um, in terms of, you know, when you think about voluntary action and collaborating, this is exciting. This is fun to to work with other people that um, that affirm your view of what could be, that validate your idea of what. A, a good place to live looks like that that work together to build things. I think we see that across many of these stories in this volume. Um, and yet at the same time, you see you see these tensions between, um, well, we see this as being key to our mission. Our main funder says, no, we want you to, to tone that down. And that happens in a couple of the chapters in this book. Um, do we want to focus on, you know, who is philanthropy for? Is it for the donor? Is it for the community? Is it for the organization, right? Um, so I think that these are some broader themes that are, are focusing in on Indiana cases. Um, can can be instructive in other contexts as well. Okay, Jim, did you have a comment on that? Uh, just just very briefly, uh, uh, I, I agree with Ruth that that you know there are sort of instructive examples that can illuminate bigger patterns or, or broader patterns uh, in in other uh, other places. Uh, and here again, yeah, just the value of, of, of it, it, a, in this case a state level study to sort of illuminate. I mean, a lot of what's happening in Indiana, you know, in terms of volunteerism, things like that is is about at the national average, you know, in that sense, Indiana is to some extent typical representative. Um, but when you drill down in the way this book does uh, in a lot of different ways, uh, you start to see some of the ways in which there are distinctive patterns that define Hoosier philanthropy uh, uh, as, as something distinctive. So you get both, right? You get some you're exploring larger patterns that that are evident uh, well beyond Indiana, but you're also, you know, coming to appreciate the ways in which local and, and state level circumstances uh, shape these kinds of activities. Greg, do you have a comment on this? Yeah, I guess just to contextualize it a little, you know, up to now, there have been a, a good number of city uh, focused studies, and then there have been some that have been more regionally focused, the north, the south, you know, those kind of broad kind of regional descriptions, maybe New England, uh, in some cases, right? So, but there really hasn't been an effort to uh, focus in on the one state. And I do think that that um, you know, sort of has been, has been mentioned, it allows for more detailed examples uh, and patterns to develop but also to, to be able to fit it into the broader um, national trends in a way that I think um, you know, it, it, it is helpful to understand. And so that, that, I'll turn it over to our own. Uh, you know, again, um, for, for Walker's story, right? Uh, those, a lot of those networks were already here, the fraternal orders, the churches, the 
um, although she's instrumental in helping to get black suffrage organizations going here in the state. Um, uh, she's engaged with temperance as well. So there's, you know, again, there's something to be said, this kind of this philanthropic infrastructure, if you will, and you think about this, um, this, this national assault on Jim Crow, you know, where black folks are trying to do throw everything they can at it from wherever they may be. And certainly, so as they, they migrate northward, they bring their associations with them or they look to those associations to help them integrate and connect with local communities and establish themselves um, and, 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 you know, press the, the, the fight for, for, for civil rights forward. So, um, so I think those, those kinds of things would be typical. And it's interesting, you see, as, as you trace Walker's travels between the cities that she lived in, one of the first things she does is she gets connected with the AME, the local AME church. She gets connected with the, the Court of Calanthe branch. She gets connected with the women's club. So so again, this this how these serve as conduits for connecting us to community is very important as well too. And those also become um, networks through which she promotes her business. She hires people. Many of the club women become Walker agents and vice, you know, so, so there's lots of connectedness there that speaks to community um, and, and the role that these networks play in, in one's life, uh, as it were. Thank you. Okay, we are getting things coming up in the, in the chat. Um, so I'll, the first question uh, we have in the chat are there any of these historical trends that we see in more contemporary philanthropy? Are there threads that may come around now or in the future? So I'll just throw that out to whoever wants to go first with it. One of the things I, I would just highlight is, um, you know, for the past um, two, three decades, right, th there's kind of been this explosion of giving circles across the country and people coming together and donating money into a pot, a certain amount that they determine everybody gives equally. And then this pot is then divvied out to organizations or causes that they agree upon. And, and, and again, when you think about this history and you think about that many of these fraternal orders and these associations had regular due structures and, and some of the fraternal orders in particular are having their own social insurance insurance and burial insurance, right? It speaks to these long-term traditions of collective giving that were instrumental before our, our, the modern welfare state system comes into play. Um, so so it's, it's, I think it's interesting to think about giving circles from this, this history of collective giving, mutual aid, and other ways that were really happening in a lot of these types of, of associations that are important to this volume. Greg? I'll just uh, I'll say somewhat um, uh, perhaps a little a little controversially, but there's virtually nothing new uh, <laughs> in, in uh, you know from a historical perspective. The the new thing is the scale, and so uh, scale varies in terms of how much money people have to give. Scale varies in terms of what people emphasize, uh, but in terms of you know we talk about donor advised funds. They were from the 1930s, community foundations from the 1910s, right? 1916 was the first one. Um, you know, so look at the look at the different trends. Uh, we have a piece on evaluation from the 1920s in Indianapolis and, and the notion of ratings uh, that we talk about today, that there's a piece of contribution by Kathy Badditcher that talks about that. And so that was really one of the motivations to write this is, uh, you know, students would come in and talk about all these new trends and, and you know, they were, uh, uh, weren't that new. And so, um, you know, I think recognizing that is, is uh, maybe I'm speaking to the choir here, but, uh, um, you know, I think that's one of the key elements to, to the book is just to see how long many of these means of giving uh, and methods of giving, just how long of a trajectory they have. And uh, Ruth or Jim, you want to comment on that question? Yeah, I I will just uh, say the whole the whole idea that what gets resourced gets done, right? Um, if there is a donor for a program, that program's going to happen. And so I think. I think this is an evergreen question of how do we evaluate success in voluntary action? Is it by the ledger book? Is it by we're doing the programs that we can get funding for? Is it by we need, can, can, we, can we mix it a little bit more? Can we, should we try and uh, 
um, try and move the needle on things that are not as popular, knowing that they're not going to be as well funded. And I'm honestly not putting that out as something with an easy answer, um, but I am putting it out to challenge uh, the assumption that raising more money by default is better because because you know that that allows us to do more yes but what does it allow you to do jim did you have a comment or you want to move on to the next question well uh, i'm looking backward not not forward here so okay <laughs> well then you you may not want to comment on the next one um which is with the more recent global crises since 2020 are there any patterns of philanthropy that are emerging now that may echo previous patterns? So, Greg? So I guess the, uh, you know, there was after, during COVID, there was a, a, a rise in mutual aid, which I think that is one of the key kind of um, historical approaches to uh, helping one another and uh, we saw that develop and you know the means might be slightly different again and, you know organizing these groups was through social media and not through the church or uh, or through a community hall but um, but the approach of just bringing together people um, to help one another to cope with whatever needs are that arose from COVID was certainly there um, you know, the individual donor donation appeals that we see with uh, methods like GoFundMe, you know, they're the modern day equivalent of someone going to a church and passing around and asking for help there. Um, but again, uh, at a scale that's much greater and I think um, able to reach a much broader audience for that uh, in that way as well. Um, so we, we do see some of those trends. Uh, there was a huge a spike in, in uh, online fundraising GoFundMe type appeals. Uh, after 2020. One of the things though that fits with um, with the pattern of, of what I talked about of who benefits is actually because of middle class people knew friends who had more money, uh, they were much more likely to have successful GoFundMe appeals than those uh, with less means. And so GoFundMe doesn't become to redistributive there. Uh, the beneficiary again uh, moves towards the middle class much more so than those in greatest need. So, Greg, do you think the the patterns we saw around COVID are uh, ephemeral or are they lasting? In terms of the online uh, GoFundMe and et cetera? Or just the mutual, the ethos of mutual aid, the intensification of that? I think that's kind of already subsided a bit. I, I, I think there's still some, uh, it's more than it was, uh, but it's it's lower than a tie point would be my, um, my, my um, sense of things. Um, you know, and, and it may have uh, really kind of slid into calls for social justice more than calls for mutual aid. I think there was a, a kind of dual crisis surrounding uh, COVID um, and, and the murder of George Floyd. Those two things came together, I think, in a way that uh, changed a lot of how people were thinking about, um, about support, philanthropic support. Okay. I would add that on a, on, a, on a more negative note, I mean, the pattern of retrenchment, especially around issues of racial justice, um, you know, we saw this with Reconstruction, we saw this with Civil Rights Movement, and now, you know, there are cases where there are foundations that were very vocal at the start of the pandemic have gone quiet on this, or there are stories in the Chronicle about they're reverting back to some of their previous grant-making patterns and, and processes that nonprofits have called laborious and, and oppressive and difficult to manage. And, and when you also look at the, the what's going on in state legislatures regarding voting rights and 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 curriculum and other things, you know, there are there are black-led nonprofit organizations that believe this is leading to uh, a challenge challenge for them and their, their very existence and whether or not even notions of, of identity-based organizations will be allowed to exist in some states. So um, that's, that's, a, that's an element, that's a pattern here. We see America makes progress and then it steps back. And we're seeing that, especially as we wait for the Supreme Court to rule on affirmative action and other things. So there are people in various corners of the sector who are, who are rallying and getting ready for these big fights. And again, this just reflects an unfortunate part of American history. Thank you. 
Um, then we have the question, have you seen any trends or philanthropists from outside Indiana that you would like to see elements of emerging more in Indiana? Well, Greg? I'll, I'll just say, uh, to me, Mackenzie Scott has nailed everything. <laughs> I mean, uh, talk about a donor who uh, understands and listens to um, organizations. Um, you know, she's reacted and in, in to, you know, the, the, her most recent decision to give to smaller uh, nonprofits was a sort of direct reaction to the critique that, you know, how do you give to people you're unaware of? She's made major gifts that are unrestricted to organizations and basically has gone sector by sector choosing organizations that have um, you know, shown success but have not always been funded. Um, really always it seems with a, a, a social and racial justice lens. And, um, and as I said, even adapted to critiques of, of her approach. And so it's a really impressive uh, approach to it. I'll say though, just as well, that the approach that the Lilly Endowment takes uh, of being trust-based, of establishing partnerships, of sticking with those partners, of making the grant, um, giving all the money up front, uh, you know, all that also strikes me as really uh, something I'd like to see exported to other foundations, um, you know, uh, nationally. And so, uh, so I, can, I can see a little bit of give and take there. else um so ruth and on the fundraising uh side of things do you see any any current trends or uh trends that you you think would be beneficial um you know one of the things that i hear from certain segments uh and this this tends to be people who think of themselves as being more entrepreneurial and coming up with these great ideas that have never been done before um is uh for example using using blockchain in such a way that you can um make a gift without without the organization knowing who gave it and and then um and then tell for example somebody who is uh apparently homeless and panhandling uh you know well you can you can just go to this organization i just made a gift and um that way that way you get to be anonymous the organization won't bother you and uh, you don't have to actually pass money to this person and you don't have to trust them to, you know, spend the money well. You just tell them, you know, uh, go over here. It's, it's a way of asserting control um, and being anonymous, right? That, that is the opposite of engagement and it's it's the opposite of Mackenzie Scott right it's very much more Elon Musk I have the money therefore my idea is good um and you can use my money the way I want you to use it but I don't want to do the work um and and I I suspect that this is an instinct that manifests and according to different technologies as they come out right um and it is the is the opposite of the the trust based the relationship based the 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 listen to the community about what the community thinks based uh so i guess that would be my contribution there yeah thank you okay i think we have uh one more question that we can do the rounds on. Uh, Greg mentioned earlier that the student philanthropy students come in with bright new ideas and Greg evidently tells them that no, somebody thought of that 100 years ago. Uh, so what? how can philanthropy benefit from the study of history beyond telling people, no, somebody already thought of that 100 years ago? Beyond crushing dreams, huh? <laughs> so. Jim, do you want to go first? 
Oh, sure. Um, well, so so in the in the area that I looked at, which is this broader realm of civic life, I think one of the one of the benefits of historical study, which kind of plays off of some of the things Greg's already said, is that uh, it, it's not only that you see things things that seem new or different or distinct have been done before, but that the past shouldn't be romanticized or idealized. There's a there's a has been over the last 25 years or so a very strong narrative around civic declension. You know, we vote less, we participate less, we bowl alone all these kinds of things around civic life. But if you go cast your uh, net back 50, 75, 100 years, it's not always that great. You know, it's a, 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 the, the history of civic life in, in earlier eras has it, real flaws in it. And so uh, we want to be careful not to sort of romanticize the past as a way of denigrating the present, right? You could argue that the most notable civic organization in the history of Indiana is the Ku Klux Klan, right? So, you, you know, we're a little better now, at least in, uh, on that score. Uh, there was a, also, I, in the course of the research for this project, I found a, a close study of community connections in a specific neighborhood in Bloomington in the late 1930s. And they basically were tracing social cohesion, social capital uh, in this very small section of Bloomington. And what they came out with in terms of their portrait of civic connections was, you know, eh. It was fine. It wasn't. It wasn't better. Really, that much better. That much worse than what we see in more recent times. Um, so we shouldn't necessarily idealize what's what's come before and just sort of submit to a narrative of decline automatically. All right, um, Ruth, would you like to go next? For me, one of the one of the things that I really highlight with my students is. Uh, that nonprofit organizations make their decisions within a policy context. And that, um, and so when you're looking at, oh, well, the poor will always be with us, you know what, our policy towards social welfare has not been consistent and that affects the scope of the problem and understanding that, I, I think that looking at, the historical um, development helps us understand why things develop the way they are, but also uh, that that we're not working in isolation. Thank you. Okay, Tyrone. Yeah, I would just say you know the history helps us again to an earlier point helps us understand this as a common project. Um, I think that's important. Um, and it's not, again, philanthropy is, is something that we all have benefited from, something we can, we can all contribute to I mean, use in different ways. Um, and I think it's important to capture that. The, 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 the typical way the history of philanthropy is written and told is very exclusive, very limited, very narrow. Um, but I think, you know, texts like this help to open that up um, and, and, and correct some of these omissions and give us a broader sense of possibility and participation, which I think is important now. It's questions now about is philanthropy declining, is charitable giving declining, and what you know, it's a, it's a complex question with many different layers to it. But I think there also is this alienation factor that many people can't relate to this word of philanthropy or not sure what to make of it, or is it this external force that's oppressive and problematic, or is it something that relates to the way in which you know my family interacts with others? Um, I think pushing that and, and understanding the different ways that it has been used, how it has evolved, um, and how how all of us have contributed a verse, if you will, in one way or another, I think is an important uh, element to recapture and to uh, to carry forward in, in our understanding and our in trying to continue to understand the nature of philanthropy, not only in the past, but then how, how it might be used in the future to address the most pressing issues we're facing. Well, thank you. Uh, Greg, I'm going to give you the last word. All right. Well, thank you. I, um, you know, I think there are a couple of things that we can think about. And, and one is, um, how does philanthropy benefit from historical understanding? I want to answer that first. But the second is, how does um, historical understanding benefit from recognizing the importance of philanthropy? And I think you know both of those are are um, relevant to, to to discuss. And one, you know, the second point I think builds on a, a bunch of what Tyrone has said tonight. But to the first point, um, you know, a lot of it is having a historical distance that allows for you to evaluate things more critically. It's easier especially within the philanthropy field where so many uh, individuals and, and especially practitioners are reliant upon current donors, it's much more easy, it's much easier to take a critical, have a critical distance to look at um, some sort of past decisions and understand, uh, you know, did those foundations step over the line there? 
uh, than to look at contemporary causes and and um, to see their um, impacts in that way. And so I think that's you know which is generally one of the benefits anyway of studying uh, history. Uh, the other is to see you know kind of a, a both that these things existed and that they've had impact, right? So I think part of it is um, understanding not only that there were struggles in the past, but actually that we do see improvement over time in some areas. And some of that has to do with the work that was put in, the money that was given, the volunteer time that was engaged with. And so I think you can uh, easily get a sort of hopeless sense of things on, on the one hand, or, or just a kind of laudatory history. And the nice thing about a, a, a scholarly history of a subject is that you get a little bit of both. And, um, and that's, I think, uh, you know, helpful to people to contextualize their own work, um, recognizing that it's going to take quite a bit of work, but also recognizing that there are breakthroughs, there are successes. And so um, keeping both of those things in mind, I think are important. But lastly, I wanna to turn to that question of uh, how can history better integrate an understanding of the impact of philanthropy, because it really is a, a very rarely mentioned in textbooks, in broader uh, histories. Uh, sometimes you'll get associations, certainly uh, the negative, you'll get the Ku Klux Klan in, in, in certain books. Um, but, you know, uh, the role of foundations in funding critical medical discoveries, the role of foundations in the early 20th century in, in, in foreign affairs, um, you know, really these organizations were at the center of interactions between the government and the, and the population and, and played a large role in how things developed over time. And most of our histories tend to leave them out. And so um, thinking about how to integrate philanthropy and, and both mass giving uh, and those efforts like, um, you know, raising money for the United Way to deal with social needs and how that may have led into creating a social welfare program or things like um, raising money for the Red Cross and how that bled into patriotism and support for wars, or um, you know, large foundations and how their particular uh, foci uh, led to new discoveries and led to um, you know, uh, something like, for instance, the, the Brown v. Board of Education decision that largely was based on a study that was funded by the Carnegie Corporation of, of racial relations. And so when we begin to see uh, and think about how philanthropy fits into history. I think there are a lot more connective tissues than most historians recognize. And so um, this is maybe a good spot to talk a little bit about that being at the Indiana Historical Society. Um, but of course, from the sense of for the practitioners, there's certainly quite a bit to be gained by understanding the longer trajectories that we see in historical studies as well. All right, well, thank you. And I, yes, I think, uh, the Indiana Historical Society is a good venue for the intersection of volunteering, philanthropy, and, and history. Uh, so our thanks uh, to the audience for your attendance and your questions, and my thanks to the panelists, and especially to Greg, who has been our fearless leader since the formation of uh, the, the first conference and then getting the volume edited. And uh, thanks to Casey and, and Bethany for their help and to the Indiana Historical Society. Uh, thank you all and good night.